Well, good day, everybody. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with our webinar here in just a minute. Um, we'll do a few announcements. Uh, hopefully, you are here to see and hear uh, the ASBE October webinar on design and construction of concrete segmental extra dose bridges. If you were looking for something else, uh, maybe you're in the wrong webinar or uh, maybe you'll enjoy this anyway. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to welcome you. I'm Greg Freeby, the Executive Director of the American Segmental Bridge Institute. We're hosting this webinar today uh, as part of our webinar series we've done this year. You see my email address there on, there on screen if you'd like to get in touch with me personally. I'd encourage you also to follow me as well as the American Segmental Bridge Institute on LinkedIn. If you're on LinkedIn, uh, it's a platform we've really been making a lot of use of to announce things like upcoming webinars and uh, other events we may be hosting. It's just a good way to to find information, current information about us. But of course, you can always go to our webinar, I mean our uh, website as well. So just uh, some quick announcements. Uh, today is the last webinar that we're doing for 2021. We'll resume those then in February of next year. Each webinar will be the last Wednesday of the month from noon to one central. You could go ahead and uh, kind of block those on your calendar. I'm sure we'll have uh, some really interesting topics again next year, uh, much like we have this year. You can always go to our website and check the events tabs to see uh the about the upcoming webinars similarly if you missed a webinar uh, in the past the recordings of the past webinars are actually also there on our website under the events tab but i'd encourage you to seek out those uh, you can view those webinars uh pretty much it's on demand anytime you want uh, as a quick reminder our 2021 convention and committee meetings are coming up uh, just around the corner uh, November 6th through 8th are our committee meetings and then the convention proper is November 8th through 10th at the Weston La Paloma Resort and Spa uh, there are actually our uh, registration spots still available the hotel however um, is booked but there are some overflow uh, opportunities uh, off property that you could you could seek out and then looking a little further down the road, our 2022 convention is October 31st through November 2nd at the Hyatt Regency in Austin, Texas. Again, I encourage you to put that one on your calendar as well. So some quick instructions about how the webinar will work today. If you lose your connection uh, at any time, you can always rejoin just using the link you were you are already provided. You will miss content while you're away. It's sort of like walking out of a room during a during a, an event. We're only going to issue be able to issue certificates uh, for attendance for professional development hours to those who meet the minimum time requirements in the session, uh, which is generally somewhere around the 50 minutes to an hour of the of the total uh, webinar time. And with regard to the attendance certificates, if you and I ask you to allow a week for us to get those to you, we actually have to do those manually. We don't use a system generated uh, webinar certificate. It's actually issued by RCEP. So we have to go through a little bit of a process to verify attendance. So we'll also do question and answer then uh, as part of this webinar at the end of the session. And I'll talk about how that's going to work. If you're working from a desktop computer, you can submit your questions. There should have a little pull down little tab that says uh, questions. You click that. You can type in your question and then we'll hold those questions until the end of the session. And then our moderator, Tim Barry, will join us uh, to, to moderate the Q&A session. And again, encourage you as the pre presentation is going, you're welcome to, to put in uh, any questions you might have as we go. If you're working on a mobile device, you also have that opportunity to put in a question, a um, little question mark up in the upper uh, right-hand corner. You just click that and again, the little dialogue will come up for allow you to input your questions. So we do meet uh, the registered continuing education program for a continuing ed for issuing certificates. So we're meeting those requirements. If uh, your licensure requires you to have uh, through a certification program, uh, we are meeting the RCEP program. So with that, I will introduce our speakers today. Uh, we actually have two folks uh, joining us from Arup. 
Uh, the first is Marcos Sanchez. He'll be our first speaker. He's a director at Arup with over 28 years of international experience in bridge design. He currently leads the Arup Irish practice and he is an Arup's Europeans bridge, uh, bridge skill leader. During his career, he's, he has combined consultancy work with in-house design for international contractors like Ferrovial. He's been in, based in Ireland since 2005 and has worked on a number uh, of designs for several long span iconic bridges across Europe and abroad, uh, combining expertise in detailed design and construction engineering. Some of the projects uh, for which he's been involved lately are the Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy Bridge over the Barrow River, uh, which is a three tower extra dose bridge with two main spans of 230 meters. We're going to hear quite a lot about that today, I'm sure. Uh, also, a feasibility study and preliminary design of the fourth bridge over the Panama Canal, which features a 500 uh, meter main span uh, currently under construction. And then the design and construction uh, of the Los Tilos Viaduct which is a 250 meter main span concrete arch in, can, in the Canary Islands. If you've ever had opportunity to Google search that one, Los Tilos Viaduct, it's an absolutely gorgeous structure in a beautiful setting, uh, as are the other bridges that I just talked about. Uh, he's an active member of international and uh, ex expert associations and committees such as F FIB and the IABSE, and a regular invited lecturer in cable supported structures uh, at Trinity College in Dublin. So Marcos will be the first uh, first we hear from. And then uh, Luke Tarasuk, also with Arup uh, in New York City is joining us today. Luke specializes in the design of complex bridges with a focus on segmental and cable stayed bridges. Uh, he's a PE in New York and Texas and a chartered engineer in Australia. He's presented at a number of conferences and special events, including the American Society of Civil Engineers, uh, the International Association of Bridge and Structural Engineering, IABSE I mentioned earlier, and of course, the American Segmental Bridge Institute, little institute near and dear to my heart. Uh, he's worked in the US, Canada, Hong Kong, Australia. Recent projects include uh, the US 181 New Harbor Bridge in Corpus Christi, Texas, uh, which will be the world's longest span segmental concrete bridge and then the Tawatina Extra Dose Bridge and Approach Guideways, as well as the Gerald Desmond Bridge, uh, Cable State and, and, and approach, uh, approach Span. So with that, I'm going to turn control over to Marcos, and you should be getting a little note now, Marcos, about yep. sharing your yeah, screen, well. and we're seeing you in slide sorter mode, so if you just start the presentation, all right. There we go. Yep. Uh, thanks, Greg, uh, for that nice introduction, and thanks everybody uh, for attending. Uh, as Greg has mentioned, uh, we're going to talk about extrato segmental bridges in this presentation, and I'm going to do a first introduction uh, in what is an stratus bridges and what are the principles behind stratus bridges, and then I'll cover a recent case study where I've been working it for the last four or five years and then my colleague Luke is going to cover another uh, stratus bridge in this case in Americas in, in northern uh, Canada. So let's start and I just to complete a bit the uh, introduction that Greg gave you uh, the bridge I'm going to talk about it today is that the stratus bridge you can see there in the picture but I've been involved in other stratus bridges in the past uh, in Poland and other parts of Ireland and smaller spans and also I'm one of the uh, final editors of the uh, current state-of-the-art publication by IFC in relation to stratus bridges that you can see there in the, in the bottom right. Uh, and what is an extratus bridge? Uh, the concept actually comes from a bridge that was never built and was developed by a French engineer uh, as a potential uh, new type of, uh, of a structure uh, in 1988. This is the model he prepared and you can see there a cross section of the bridge and the tower and it, it, it is coming, they word extratus from a French uh, uh, evolution into English of out of your back. In the, the extratus in French will mean coming out of your back of, the, of your spine. And the concept uh, uh, as such is basically as it was defined at the time by or theorized by uh, Jacques Marivar as increasing the lever arm that internal external extension it will give in a conventional bridge. And explained in a different way 
uh, you have a cable state bridge and a long uh, span concrete structure where you can achieve a certain level of slenderness in your deck by the contribution of a cable system in providing elastic support over the span as opposed to a conventional box on which you need to take all the bending by the lever arm that you can produce with PT, which leads to obviously a limitation in span and heavier structures as, as the span increases. If you go to external post tension in this effect of uh, a limitation in your span, uh, to the F ratio is even larger because you lose the effective uh, lever arm because if you are operating within the box, even you might have some additional contribution of a polygonal shape of a cable. So the concept developed by, uh, theoretically by uh, uh, Jacques Maribard was what happens if I actually increase my lever arm by pushing the cable out of the back of a bridge, which is where, where Extratos comes. But if you do that with many cables, what you end up is with a bridge that in principle resembles a cable state bridge in, uh, in shape and, and aesthetics. But in reality, the concept is actually a hybrid that is coming from uh, an enhanced lever arm cable system using external post tensioning. And what it happens obviously is that this, the deck, span to depth ratio and the amount of concrete you have in your deck and the structural depth you can achieve is a kind of in between what you will get in a cable state bridge that is always a slender and, the, and it's that line in red. Of, of that, and what you will have actually in a conventional box. And those are the principles behind, behind uh, uh, the uh, original idea that define and pioneer stratal bridges. Since then, there, there are many of them built uh, all over the world. Mostly Japan is a country with a lot of uh, extratus bridges. And if you look at the main parameters that define an extratus bridge, when you, in the, at the top here, you have the conventional uh, multi-span uh, beam uh, box, where the span to death ratio tend to be in 1 in 50 to 1 in 30 over mid-span, and around 1 in 20 to 1 in 16 at supports with a, a distribution of spans that can be multiple spans because they can take the loads uh, itself. While a conventional cable state bridge achieve a far larger stiffness, in some cases even constant depth or a slightly variable depth of other supports, in 1 in 55 or even larger, depending on what is the separation of your cables, uh, uh, or the 1 in 200, sorry, which is at the bottom, um, okay? Usually in constant depth. But it, obviously the, one of the issues that you have with uh, cable state bridges is that you need back spans and side spans with a particular ratio. You don't usually have multi span because you lose the effectiveness uh, of the side spans stiffening the main span with the cable system. And in the middle, you have the parameters of an extratus bridge. Which it is in between. You don't achieve the slenderness of 1 into 50. You stay in 1 in 55 around mid span. And again, at supports, you can stay in around 1 in 35. The other visual clear uh, distinction is that the towers are actually uh, shorter than you will have in a in, in a conventional cable state bridge. Rather than one fifth of the span, you tend to be in one tenth of the span. So that is kind of the visual geometry that define a stratus bridges that sits in between a continuous box and a conventional cable state uh, bridge. When you go to uh, other parameters, and this is just actually uh, producing a set of different uh, bridges of, of different uh, span in the top uh, table, you have the cost index over a cost of one. And as you can see, the cost obviously increases in that. Uh, obviously, there are many other parameters that influence, have a significant influence in the cost of a bridge, like foundations and other type of complications on top of the span. But in general, obviously, the span increases with depth and, and, and cable state bridges uh, because of the cable system and so on. They, they, first, there are very few of them less than 100 meters tall and then to be more when the span goes over 200 meters. And you can see that the stratos also in terms of cost tend to fit in between the cost of the strat of a, as the span increases, but in between the cost of what a conventional box will be and a, what a cable state bridge. In terms of uh, the amount of concrete used in the deck, which is the metric you have in the bottom uh, graph, you can also see uh, that the average span of concrete in cubic meters per square meter of deck also kind of tend to sit in between the two linear correlations when I started for cable state bridges or box uh, bridges, which again tends to lead the concept of a stratus bridge towards it's a hybrid and a halfway between a cable state bridge and a continuous uh, beam box bridge. 
another important parameter, and, and these uh, two graphs can be a bit confusing. Uh, the, most of the Americans will be familiar with the one in, in on the right, which is coming from a PTI that establishes the principles for which when you have a relatively low cable force or cable range of forces due to light load and, and other parameters, you are able to actually uh, design your cable for a higher phi factor up to 0.75. Uh, and I've included on the right and the left the cores that are used in, in Europe for Stratos bridges, which are uh, the values are slightly different because the safety factors and the, and the combinations that are used in the stress and service are slightly different, but actually are very, very similar in terms of the principles behind those cores. You can nearly superimpose them because it's based on the same principles in the design of Stratos bridges, as in you can increase the final force in your cables for the service or strength combinations depending on what is the stress range that the cable has under light load. And obviously Stratos bridges has lower cable uh, stresses under light load because the cable is shallower and is less effective uh, against light loads. So in summary, uh, before we go into the case studies, we're going to the fight, cable state, the Stratos bridges use cable uh, state bridge technology. In terms of the cables, they have a hybrid behavior, they have a hybrid behavior between due to the box stiffness and the cable system ratio uh, being not as, uh, the cable system not as effective as in a cable, uh, conventional cable state bridge. bridge. And from a visual point of view, a shallower cable uh, that produces a less effective cable produces a shorter tower and has a, a particular uh, visual appearance of having a short tower with a, with a shallow cable. And another peculiarity of extractor breaches, which is also very important, because the cable system is less effective and the net is stiffer, you can provide multi span solutions as opposed to cable state breaches, where you lose a lot of effectiveness when you try to do three, four, five main spans uh, consecutively, unless you have a very, very stiff pipe. Okay, an example, for example, of this type of breach in, in Europe is this breach in Switzerland by Christian Men. You can clearly see how short the towers are compared to the span. And in this case, this bridge has actually six span, and probably most of you will be more familiar with this other bridge, which is the San Croix, over the San Croix River in Minnesota, that again has four main spans of around 600 feet. And as you can see, there's certain stiffness in the tower, but you can produce a relatively uh, slender deck compared to what would be a, a conventional balance cantilever for the same uh, span nearly at, at 600 feet. And you can produce a multi span structure as well, which won't be uh, uh, easy to do in a cable, a conventional cable state uh, arrangement. So, from an aesthetics point of view, it's clear that Stratos bridges have a peculiar shape as in having shorter towers, which can be very uh, efficient in uh, systems where you have, uh, for example, like uh, limit air, air draft limitation because it can be close to airports and so on. And in other cases, can be just pure aesthetics uh, to produce a balance where you don't have very high towers or very heavy decks in between a cable state bridge or a, a, or a conventional box. And in terms of cost, in my experience, and this is quite a controversial uh, point because uh, not everybody uh, comes to the same conclusion. My experience is that extractor bridges are slightly more expensive than conventional boxes for the same span. But, uh, and that probably is not, it starts to get actually uh, the same around the 200, 220 meter span. And usually when you go to steel composite decks and, and so on. So there are many other variables in the equation, but it's a good compromise in terms of actually high aesthetics and not a heavy structure and, and it's not a, it's as expensive as cable steel bridges. And now in the second part of the presentation, after having a short introduction in the main uh, principles of drive stratus bridges, we're going to cover two uh, projects of which are, uh, have been involved lately in the digital design and erection engineering. One is in Europe, which is the RFK on the river barrel, and the second one will be covered by my colleague Luke and Twadina. So now I'm going to talk about, for the next uh, 25 minutes, about the river barrel bridge. Uh, uh, Rusty General Kennedy River and the River Barrel, which is a three towers to uh, uh, Tower bridge, uh, Extratus bridge, as you can see there uh, in the picture uh, after completion, like in, 20, in 2020. Uh, the first part of my presentation is going to be about the project history and some of the constraints and value engineering on the project and why the bridge has this shape and how we actually uh, are got involved in, in the design uh, of the structure. And first of all, the, for you that might not be familiar with our land, the bridge is located in the very south of the island. It's very close to a small town called New Ross, 
that has some uh, among other uh, interesting points for Americans. I'll say that the homestead of uh, John C. Gerald Kennedy, the former president, is actually just uh, around a mile away from the bridge, still located there in this, that small town south of the, the of the bridge. So the family, the Kenny, uh, Kennedy family, actually left on a, on a boat in the in the 19th century. I think it's the grandfather, the grandmother of uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy from New Ross to go into, into America and ended up being obviously president of the United States, as most of you know. And that's the reason actually that led the Irish state to give the name, the uh, matter of, of John F. K., uh, JFK, yes, as Ross Fitzgerald Kennedy. Okay, the bridge is located across in the River Barrow to bypass the city of New Ross. And the bridge is actually pretty wide. The river is pretty wide at the, lo at the chosen location for the bypass, around a thousand feet. In, in an area, a thousand feet, in an area of the river that is actually tidal, which actually brings uh, some other complications in terms of foundations and choosing spans. And you can see there's a clear difference in height between the left side of, and, of the bridge and, and the right side of the bridge, which is in the floodplain. Uh, it was not actually uh, decided to be a stratus without actually doing some different studies of, of type of bridges and were leaf arches and other different type of structures were studied by uh, the planning team and uh, it was finally decided that the best option in properties, I mean, as you can see, our line is not particularly uh, dramatic in terms of high mountains uh, or slopes of all gentle hills. That's why they decided to go for a structure that had relatively short towers and avoiding a heaviness of covering a thousand feet uh, main span or close to a thousand feet with a conventional balance uh, balance cantilever. The architect that came up uh, with the final design also decided not to have three towers e e exactly the same and play with some aesthetic ratios related to the golden ratio and ended up with the central tower being slightly uh, higher than the side towers. At that stage, and the art system is particularly, uh, and it's important to highlight this because it changes obviously from uh, what happened in, in might happen in America some, or in other uh, countries. Uh, restrictive in terms of planning, when a project gets pl planning and gets uh, environmental uh, uh, approval, certain parameters are fixed that are not possible to modify by the, uh, the, during the, the tender for construction in a DNC or a, a P3 or whatever or a type of scheme. In this case. The spans at 755 feet were fixed. The length of the bridge was fixed plus minus uh, 20 feet on each side at the position of the abutments. And similarly, there was a navigational channel for uh, the river uh, of 180 um, feet uh, vertical clearance and the horizontal uh, clearance of around 300 feet was also fixed along with the tower heights and so on. So all those parameters were fixed. The bridge was going to be a stratus regardless of what the different designers might come up with. What you could change uh, as part of the value engineering and the, D and the DNC tender is the specimen design had a very basic uh, high level concept cross section, including a, a wide pylon with three planes of cables parallel in the center and a cross section with outer webs. That uh, it was one of the areas where you, can, you would have certain leeway to change, which is what we did. One of the main things we did is like the, you can see the specimen design in the top. And what we did in the uh, in, in our value engineering, and we won the tender uh, as a DNC with a, a Spanish contractor, Trugados, and an Irish contractor, Palm, Palm Ireland, and the design team of Arup and Spanish consultant, Carlos Fernandez Casado, is that we changed the cross section. We put two webs at eight meters spacing and basically uh, support the cable using an internal prop, only at cable locations, which is what you can see there in green. And in order to give the same kind of aesthetic appearance of a closed section, we basically use precast panels to create a prop uh, with nearly a closed uh, uh, physical appearance. The next step in our design was to minimize the bridge width as much as we could, because obviously the moment you have to do a concrete deck, which was another requirement, we couldn't go for steel or steel composite. It was going to be a uh, the world record in, in, in terms of a span for concrete uh, stratus bridges at 230 meter, which is uh, more than 800 uh, feet. We needed to make a structure as narrow as possible that we minimize the pylon width with 1.6 meters by using saddles and having a single cable rather than three at 127 strands. The tower height was very difficult to change as the same because of the planning application. So it's always going to be a stratus bridge with relatively 
short towers of 27 and 17 meters. And the slenderness actually fits very nicely in the conventional uh, parameters of extractors breaches with a, a span divided by 65 and mid span and span by, divided by 28 at the central tower that is slightly uh, higher and, 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 and span divided by 35 at the side towers. And, this, and as I'm saying, we the whole concept of the cross section was to provide a balance between the position of a cable and the in, transversal bending of the main cable versus the cantilevers in the cross section. As I said, uh, it is important, in, and that's one of the advantages of the stratus bridges when you have relatively short towers that they, you might not have too much bending on the tower due to uh, like lateral loads and so on, is to try to minimize the pylon dimensions and by the use of saddles, you don't need access or anchor boxes into the tower, which allows you to go to, in this particular case, to a really slender tower, only 1.6 meter uh, width. So in summary, the bridge that we end up designing, uh, fulfill all the parameters of planning with two main span in the stratus bridges at 760 feet and a total length of 3,000 3, feet uh, with the span to the radius that I've mentioned that are uh, span divided by 65, 35 at, at, at the side towers and, and 28 at the central tower, which is a very slender uh, structure given the, the main span. This structure is currently the world record uh, for a concrete stra stratus bridge at, at 230 meters. I mean, main span 766 feet, which uh, basically broke the record in concrete of the previous bridge was in Poland from 206, and it's not the longest stratus bridge in, in the world, which is in, in Japan with 275 meter main span. But that bridge has more than 100 meter in, of the span in steel composite, which is obviously uh, quite advantageous in terms of saving weight and obviously a completely different behavior uh, at mid span in terms of actually the tension that the steel can take. In terms of detailed design, I'm going to cover now quickly a few points uh, of what are the main uh, parameters that define this bridge in terms of uh, detailed design, both in global and, and local behavior, and then I will go into, into some of the main issues that we had during construction. Uh, this uh, diagram is the bending moment diagram of the envelope of uh, permanent loads plus uh, live load traffic. And what you have in purple is the optimum that you will get if you can change the cable shape and have a conventional three tower cable uh, state bridge and the red is what you will have if you don't have any cable system and you basically have a, a continuous beam with, with exactly the same spine as you can see in this case by the shallowness of the cable the bending moment the bending moment diagrams that you obtain for both both the hog and sack at, at support and at, at mid span is nearly halfway in, on average of what you have between a cable system that is very close to a cable state bridge or no cable system at all which basically uh, again points towards this bridge is a hybrid cable state bridge uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the conventional continuous beam from the point of view of cable forces as i mentioned earlier on uh, in the general uh, introduction cable uh, stay bridges have usually like larger ranges of cable uh, forces usually around 200 uh, newton square millimeter or a 50 to 80 square millimeter uh, which is the convention for stratus bridges this bridge actually those are the two limits you have there the bottom one is when you assume a, a, ver a higher force because your cable has very little range in in, in stresses to life load and the top uh, dashed line is what you have in the uh, in, in conventional cable state which with higher range you can see that some of the cables particularly backstays in the side spans they do have actually a behavior very close to a, a cable state bridge as in the, the stress range is even close is more than 18 k size of 0.26 uh, MUTs <laughs> in in those cables but in the central tower what you go at the it's actually closer to a conventional stratus behavior where the stress range that you get under live load which is the uh, y-axis in in those tables is actually close to the 7.73 ksi and you can take advantage of higher uh, uh, cable forces uh, because the deck is stiffer and the cables are actually short enough another important factor in stratus breaches is that the vertical alignment of the bridge might have a significant influence in the particular case of uh, ross Fitzgerald kennedy bridge the, the bridge is in a slope, as I mentioned at, at the beginning in the landscape uh, picture across the river. 
is going from a low point to a high point with a 5% slope. And that means that the cable forces, because the cables are so shallow, are very different between back stays and forward stays. So, as you can see there, they vary between 9 degrees in, when you're going uphill and 14 degrees when you're going downhill. That means that the stresses that you can get in your deck are very different between spans that are more or less symmetrical, or they have an appearance of being symmetrical because of the asymmetry created by the vertical alignment, and that can govern significantly the behavior of your bridge. In our case, we were using a high strength concrete in certain parts of the bridge due to the high stresses. And we minimized the amount of areas where we were using high strength concrete that you can see there in blue. We use it when in Europe we call a C1895, which equates to an 11 KSI concrete. And as you can see, it's not symmetric to the main tower, and it's precisely because of this effect of the alignment that is producing an asymmetry in the cable in the cable contribution to the total bending of, of the deck. Another important element to take into account in the stratus bridges is that the shallowness of the cable, particularly if you go for very high cables, on top of the conventional uh, problems that you have in terms of detailing and of concentrated forces of cable that you need, uh, cable forces that you need to both, in blue you have there, the spread of the load, and then the red is basically the vertical component of a cable to avoid significant bending through the props into the top slab. You have another issue, which is that you, the cable itself is very shallow and is interrupting your concrete section for a significant length. In the, the particular case of uh, it, 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 the River Barrow Bridge, it is actually significant. The segments are actually 6.5 meters long. And basically, the shallowness of a cable, given the size of, uh, of the 127 form tube itself, we were basically losing half the section on every segment at, at mid span, which you have actually the highest uh, transverse bending. And that actually forces to uh, not only to have a transverse PT, but transverse PT located in a very, very constrained area, even with plan profiles for the cable in, to achieve the amount of PT we needed on every segment. And I'm going to talk about, about key issues uh, during construction of, of a bridge like this. Let me go. Yeah. And, there was a lot of actually discussions on whether even like at some point uh, like precast uh, full section and our casting C2 segments and or common informed travelers or can deliver in both towers or three towers or a central tower and so on. And after a lot of discussions with the contractor and optimizing the program, the final construction sequence that was chosen is this one that you can see schematically on the top, where in red you have the part that was actually built with a scaffold to the ground for the core of the section or a wind traveler for uh, cantilevers in transverse cross section, and only four four travelers in C2 were used for the main spans. Two of them starting from uh, each of the side towers, and a conventional balance cantilever with two sec uh, four travelers for the central tower. There were three temporary towers required. The side span towers were only compression, and they were used as if they were built before the main span was uh, built, as the main span was built and the cables were in place. Those towers uh, basically uh, enter in tension and, and basically pr stop providing support to the 95 meter side spans. In the central tower, the problem is slightly different. You need actually stiffness both during construction and also for uh, wind loads and, and, and other effects to avoid oversizing your central foundation. And we provide that uh, vertical uh, support. We would call it the push pull prop, but there was more tension. Uh, against the, the the deck itself, uh, and I was able to take compression and, and, and tension. This is a picture of the uh, construction of the approach spans uh, and the side spans. You can see the foreign traveler for the main span being installed, part of the scaffold for the central core, and also the wind traveler built over, uh, building the cantilevers uh, over the side spans behind it. This is another picture of one of the side spans as well, and you can see the precast panels uh, that were used in the cantilever uh, props. Uh, the rest of the section was cast in situ in order to uh, accelerate the construction of the, of the section. In this case, uh, for the side spans in the, for, in, in the uh, with a wind traveler. And as I mentioned earlier on, the cable, you can see how shallow the cable angle is compared to the deck. This is around 10 degrees. Uh, in this case, uh, in one of the uh, cables that are shallower going in, uh, towards the uh, slope going down, and as you can see there, I mean, the transverse, you can see the, the white dots of the transverse PT uh, crossing before and after the cables. You can see it in here as also in another, in another cable. This, it was extremely constrained and every, nearly in every direction, there was no room for additional PT or bars due to the inter interference in particular of the shallowness of, of, of the cables. And now I'm going to touch another important issue, which is very, very 
fundamental and, and paramount to actually address properly in the strata of breaches. Usually, if you go to very long spans, which is that, a, like in any, or, uh, any other concrete breach and geometry control, you have certain uh, elements that are uncertain, and you might have your best guess in terms of the weights of the foreign traveler and its own deflection, the segment weight itself, concrete uh, young models, and, so, uh, and time dependent uh, effects, and, and obviously the, the, the construction load and, and the real sex program and sex segment cycle. The way we tackle this in this bridge, uh, given the size of the span we're going to give, and, and the shallowness of the cable doesn't allow you to control your deflections as much as a conventional cable state bridge will do, was basically having two independent models between our and our partner consultant, Fernando Casano. So we were checking all the time and producing sensitivity checks of different parameters uh, against the real bridge, and we updated the models and had to update the models there as the bridge was being built. Uh, a key element in this regard is like, I mean, it's very difficult to produce uh, good creep curves at very, very early ages, like at, at 36 hours or 40, uh, 24 hours. So you usually have to extrapolate from your, this is actually using the European codes that allows you to, from different test, specimen tests to produce your creep curves. But usually your tests and your specimens are at three days or seven days. So if you need to extrapolate what happens at very early ages, like 36 hours. In this particular case, another issue that is important with stratus breaches due to the shallowness of the cable, you are usually not able to stress in the, the segment just be, be behind the, the cable because it's too close to the foreign traveler itself and the cable is so shallow that you don't have access to the same segment you're actually uh, placing on your river and PT. So you tend to be uh, in a segment when you're working on casting segment N, you're actually stressing cable in segment N minus two. This is a, a clear example of uh, this is the different elements in the cable as it was installed. Like you can see the guys installing the cable. You can see the front traveler there in red in the top uh, left picture. That is actually at, uh, what, uh, at the moment placed to cast segment N and they're actually stressing cable at N minus two. All these elements uh, are uh, significant, but the most important one is the concrete and concrete uh, properties at early stages and also the uh, program versus uh, real uh, construction times. And as you can see there, when we produce our first casting curves for this bridge, but it was cast in situ, as I mentioned, we assume certain days that were uh, agreed with the contractor, but as always on site, things go differently. And you can see the difference there in, in the bars, which were the real casting times for different segments, and A R and B were two different incidents that happened on site and, and, and delayed the whole construction. Uh, and then the most important element that we had and the lesson learned for us in this bridge is that we found out that particularly with, with very high strength concrete, as I mentioned in some sections, the concrete was 11K size, is that at very early ages, the concrete did not behave as the models extrapolated from the tests were, were saying. And by actually producing real tests in the bridge, by stressing cables, this is the movement upwards in cable 12, and the two models, which are in, in Orange that we're giving, and what the reality of the cantilever was. Uh, as you can see, that the difference between the discrepancy were only at very early ages. Segments were that were 36 hours, nine days, or 11 days, or 18, 19 days. That made us think that we were underestimating the young modulus at uh, early ages, and it led to changing the construction program uh, slightly, and, not, and only. Uh, stressing and moving the foreign traveler uh, to the next segment at 50 hours traveling process. This is a bridge that is extremely uh, slender, and because of the different in height uh, between the towers and, and, the, and the spans, that basically means that the central tower has 18 cables, while the side towers have nine cables, which means the main span, uh, in reality, the, can the main can cantilever to be 140 from the central tower, and the side spans 90 meters. That asymmetry means that the central tower is extremely flexible and equates as 140 to a nearly 280 main span uh, from that point of view. And that led, as you can see here, combined with the cable uh, lag in terms of stressing that when we were actually reaching the uh, closure segment, there was a difference of nearly uh, more than half a meter, which in concrete is a <laughs> significant difference. This is before, obviously, that uh, uh, those dimensions are in meters. At that stage, the side spans have around 400 mil deflection, while the main span has more than a meter deflection. But that's because at that stage, neither cable 17 or 18 in the central tower were stressed, while the last segment was already casted. And another significant uh, effect of this asymmetry in the cantilevers is that because 
these two cantilevers of different length, you need to provide a closure element that can actually take all the different deflections that the cantilevers will take once the central uh, closure segment is casted. Okay, and this is an example, uh, another picture of this uh, closure element, which was uh, actually can give you the idea of the dimensions that it really has. The section is three and a half meters deep, so you can appreciate how stiff was the closure uh, element required to be. And finally, I mean, this bridge, like many other modern bridges, that are uh, particularly comprehensive structural health monitoring. And at the moment, we can actually measure, apart from the conventional climate uh, parameters in the bridge, in terms of wind and temperature and humidity, we also can measure uh, like deflections uh, at different locations of the bridge, cable forces, and rotations and, and very loads and so on in, in, in real time. And this is an example of the cable forces in particular, like the longest cables in both side towers and in the in the central tower uh, uh, at different stages. You can see that actually the, the, the little sets in, in between each uh, vertical line is around a day. So it's basically the temperature what governs uh, at the moment with very little traffic in the bridge, uh, the reflections, uh, the cable forces uh, according to the structural monitoring system. And now I'm going to actually uh, give a uh, word to my colleague, uh, Luke Jurassic, that is going to continue the presentation with another case study of a bridge in, in, in America. Thank you, Marcos. Just checking you can hear me and see my screen. Sure can. Fantastic. Okay, thank you, Marcos and Greg. So I'm gonna talk about the second case study here, the Tawatna Bridge over the North Saskatchewan River. So this is a, a bridge in Edmonton in Alberta in Northern Canada. And this is a photo that was taken about a month ago uh, showing the bridge in the foreground with the, uh, the full colors starting to show through. So why was an extra dosed uh, bridge chosen on this project? The main driver was aesthetics. The client wanted a signature bridge for the project and a landmark bridge for the local residents. Uh, and although this, this photo is quite old now compared to some of the other ones that I'll show, I like it because it's, it's taken at from the top of the valley and you can see that the top of the tower there uh, aligns with the top of the valley. So a, a girder bridge in this location wouldn't have been a, a landmark structure and a cable stay bridge would have had its towers poking out of the valley. So it would, it would not have integrated as well into the local surroundings. So the, the history of this site was that there was a previous bridge built here, uh, the pedestrian bridge on the screen and it was a well-loved pedestrian bridge and, and tied into the, the riverbank. Uh, so, so to maintain that connection, the, the new bridge that was chosen uh, was a two-level solution with the lower level retaining that existing connection into the local parks and trails. So the, the upper half of the bridge is, carries uh, two tracks of light rail and the lower half is a, is a lightweight steel pedestrian bridge. And uh, it's, it's three spans with the biggest being 360 feet. So, so uh, about half the size of, of, the Robert, of the Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy Bridge. It's got seven cables and they run from one side of the deck to the other through a, a central saddle in the pylon. So the, the pre-stressing inside this bridge is very similar to a typical girder bridge. We have cantilever tendons in the top slab uh, near the pylon and uh, continuity tendons in the bottom slab in the spans. So, so some of the advantages that, that an extra dose bridge brought uh, for this particular solution was that we were able to use a uniform thickness of deck along the hull span rather than having to haunch it. Uh, like you would at a girder bridge, uh, which was which which we which was important for this bridge because 
it allows us when you look at the bridge and elevation to have two clean parallel lines of the rail bridge and the pedestrian bridge. Additionally, the, the extra dose bridge allowed us to keep a, quite a, a thin cross section along the length for the span. But I, I will note that even though there is no change in depth at the supports, there is uh, a thickening in the bottom slab near the pylon. So this is a, a picture of the cross section. You can see the two tracks of light rail there. So this, this bridge has two planes of cables, whereas the RFK bridge has only one plane of cables. And, uh, and there's some positives and negatives to using, to using either of these. So two planes of cables means two pylon legs, whereas one plane of cables means one, one pylon leg. So there's obvious efficiencies uh, with just having one pylon leg in terms of less material and it's it's quicker to build. But when when you use the just just the one the single plane of cables, the the cables connect in the middle of the box and that requires these steel struts to be added. Whereas on Tawatina where we have them on the outside of the box, we just have a simple uh, concrete blister to anchor the the cables in. Uh, so Marcos talked a bit about how the, the shallow angle of the guide pipes on the RFK bridge interrupted a lot of the, the flexural reinforcement and post-tensioning. Uh, so that, that, that's one disadvantage of this solution where the, the cable sort of cuts through the one of the, the primary uh, flexural elements of the cross section. Whereas on the, on the Tawatina bridge, you can see that the the live load sits in the middle of the box girder. So the primary transverse flexural reinforcement is in the top slab and in the webs. So out where the guide pipes and the shallow guide pipes cut through the top slab, it's, uh, it's not major reinforcement that needs to be cut. So talking a bit more about the cross section. So the original design of the cross section section used a rectangular concrete box girder and you can see in this picture that the the stay cables were some distance away from the webs of the box girder and and the distance between those two meant that there was a large transverse bending moment that needed to be taken so to resolve that a transverse co cross beam was used at each of the cable locations the, the, the client also wanted a streamlined cross-section, so precast panels were going to be used to provide that aesthetic. But finally, in the cross-section, you can see that because the cables are both pulling outwards and the webs are pulling downwards, there's a transverse tension that needs to be resolved in that cross-beam. So as, a, as, a, as an alternative technical concept that I proposed, uh, a, a inclined trapezoidal, sorry, a trapezoidal box girder with inclined webs was proposed, and this is the final solution. And this has a few advantages. So the first is that we, we kept the streamlined look by using the inclined webs, and we've brought the eccentricity between the cable and the webs right down. So now it's a very small moment that needs to be taken by the box and, and the box as is, is sufficient to take that moment. There's no ribs requ required inside the box, which simplifies the construction of the, the segments and the internal formwork. Additionally, the, the angle of the cables and the angle of the box girder are now aligned, so there's no resultant force to be taken. So Marcos was talking on the on the RFK bridge about how uh, the the central cantilever on that bridge was uh, was longer, and uh, on this this project we had the same uh, same thing. So it's a it's a two span uh, extra dose bridge, but we cantilevered basically the full 100 110 meter 360 foot span. Uh, so, so that's that's equivalent to building a bridge of of twice that span, and the reason that's significant is because the longer the span gets, the more complex the construction gets, and the more important things like geometry control 
and wind becomes. So Marcos talked about geometry control and I'm going to talk about wind in a minute. The other thing is uh, that there, there, when you when you when you go to design a bridge like this, and you you look up the span to depth ratios and the tower height to span ratios that Marcos showed earlier, that they they don't really there's not really much guidance for a two span bridge. Um, so so this is a little bit different in its proportions to to other extra dose bridges. Moving on to the detailed design now. So there's a number of different ways to anchor or pass through cables in a pylon and options A and B here uh, are both not commonly used in extra dose bridges and that's because both of these require access into the pylon to uh, install the uh, install and maintain the cable anchor heads. So with extra dose bridges we, we have short, shorter towers and they're of smaller cross sections than in cable stay bridges. And so solutions A and B would require pylons larger than necessary for the forces imposed upon them. So options C and D are commonly used. And C is where you anchor the stays on either side of the pylon, and then you have a, a piece of mild steel in between them, or, or high strength steel. To, to transmit the force from one side to the other. And D is, is where you use a saddle to take the, the cable continuous through. Uh, so Marcos showed the pylon for the, the uh, RFK bridge before. This is another cable stay bridge that I designed a few years ago in San Francisco. And it just shows you when you, when you use a saddle, how, how small and slender a pylon you can use. And we see the same thing on the Tawatina Bridge uh, in, in the central picture there. And, and you can see we've got a, a little neat detail there where the ladder is incorporated into the, the pylon, which gives a, a nice aesthetic detail. So, so all of the saddles on this project are fabricated to the same radius. They're all around seven feet, fabricated by VSL. And VSL did testing on each of those saddles to make sure that as the strands pass over, that seven foot radius that there's no loss in strength. The saddles themselves are steel boxes uh, filled with a high performance concrete and each of the strands go through the saddle individually. So a few watch it's on saddles. The first is that uh, when you get loads on one side of the bridge and not on the other, then the cables will pull on the pylon from one side more than the other. And you need to check that there's no slip between the strand and the saddle. And the other watch it is that the cables impose quite a high vertical loads on the concrete in the pylon. So underneath the saddles, you need to provide uh, bursting reinforcement to deal with the dispersion effects of that force. So onto the cables now. So as we'd mentioned before, extra dose bridges have uh, stiffer decks and shallower cables, which uh, means the, the live load stresses in cables are lower. So you can use a higher strength resistance factor. So on this, on this bridge, the, the shortest cable actually has the highest stress and the longest cable has the lowest stress. And, and that's because the, the shorter cables are, are the most vertical and they're, they're closer to mid-span than the longer ones, which are, are closer to the supports. Uh, so we were able to use a, a higher strength resistance factor uh, for most of the span of 0.75. So when you when you talk about extra dose bridges, you, you're getting into your longer spans and Ashto gives some guidance in the segmental bridge construction about wind uplift on cantilever, this 0.005 KSF. But where you've got a cantilever, you know, over 300 foot in length, if the structure is particularly tall or if you're in a windswept site, then, then there's a watch it that this, this number can be, can be off by several orders of magnitude. 
so so on on Tawatna, we did a fairly detailed study into the wind. So a, as the wind goes across the cross section, you get lift on the section and you get drag. And for this cross section, the lift is actually twice the drag. And that means that as the as the wind blows over the bridge, the average wind or the hourly wind, the bridge will lift up a bit. And then as the as gust of wind comes through, the bridge will lift up a little bit more. As the gust dies down, the bridge will move back downwards. So so the bridge is moving up and down as the gusts blow through. And then additionally, the gusts don't necessarily hit the entire length of the bridge at one time. So th this is a bit simplified, but it, it, you can imagine it hitting one side of the bridge uh, at one point in time, lifting that up, and then the other side of the bridge at another time, lifting that side up. So, so, so as you get that uh, the gusts happening and hitting different parts of the bridge, you start to excite the natural frequencies of the bridge. And uh, on this bridge, the the natural frequency of the bridge actually aligned with those with the frequency of the gusts. So, like when you push someone on the swing, right? You, you push them, they go down, and then they go up to the the top point, then they swing back down, back to where they started, and then you push them again on the way back down. So, so in in that time, like in that swing example, the the gusts and the, and the bridge are sort of lining up to to maximise this motion, which gave very large bending moments in the base of the pylon. So the solution for that on this project was to add a tie down, and not only does that uh, create now a push pull to resolve the what was just a moment on the pylon into the the tie down and the pylon, but it, it also changes the the frequency of the structure. So we were at six seconds a period. Now this is at two point three seconds. So the the frequency of the structure and the frequency of the gusts now have enough separation, and uh, and there's a lot less forces on the bridge imposed by the wind. So this is an image of the tie down. It was fairly simple, a few pre-stress bars tying the box down to the, uh, we were able to use the pedestrian bridge abutment uh, for that. And if we jump back to the RFK bridge, you can see that uh, they had a temporary pier here, uh, which you know not, is not only there for for wind reasons; it's also there to make sure that the the unbalanced moment uh, doesn't exceed. Uh, so sorry that the that the permanent foundations are not governed by the construction moment, uh, but rather the the permanent moment. Okay, onto the construction now. So the the bridge is built uh, cast in situ balanced cantilever like the RFK bridge. And the, the pier table in the first five segments use cantilever post-tensioning. So that's post-tensioning in the top slab, uh, a pair of tendons per segment. Uh, so he, here's an image of it showing the, the cold environment in Edmonton. And the, the travelers used on this project uh, by Aluma uh, were actually used on two previous segmental projects. Uh, so that's a nice sustainability story there and uh, and allowed for a, a cost-effective construction method. So Marcos and I are both talking about cast-in-place balanced cantilever bridges, but uh, there's no reason building an extra dose bridge that you can't uh, do a precast segmental bridge. Uh, this one's not extra dose, it's cable stayed. This is the new harbour bridge that our Epstein engineer of record for. Um, just showing that, you know, precast segmental is an option for these types of bridges as well. So uh, as the cantilever grows longer, the cables start to get installed. And uh, the, the backspan on this project was done on false work. So this is an image of the, the bridge with three of the cables installed. And in terms of cycle times, and I'll, I'll have a, pl a plot in a few slides time, the, the cables do slow things down a bit. They're not as quick to install as post-tensioning. The, the guide pipes need to be erected first, 
and then the strands are threaded individually from one anchorage through the saddle down to the other anchorage and then the strands are stressed uh, strand by strand sorry the, the cables are stressed strand by strand so that that is a bit slower than than uh, using than if you were just using post tensioning tendons uh, here's a brief image of the the false work then we get uh, to the closures near the abutment and the pier and we install the the continuity post tensioning so that's the the red line there the post tensioning in the bottom of the box and here's an image of that showing the the traveler was used for the closure formwork. Uh, we did have some uh, strong back beams. It might have been taken away in this picture, uh, but but they weren't nearly as as big or or bulky as the one on the RFK bridge. That wasn't a a big issue for us. Finally, the pedestrian bridge was installed, and uh, here's a sort of zoomed Im image showing that uh, lower level of the bridge. And you can see some of the the overlooked places that uh, pedestrians will have to enjoy the beautiful river valley. So, in terms of the cycle time, uh, the the first segment first segments always take a while to to put up because you you've got to drop the pier table false work and you've got to erect the travellers and then cast the segments. Uh, but then, then after a while, we're able to get down to a, a sort of optimum cycle time of about 12 days. Um, cycle time was probably a little bit slower on this job than if we were doing it uh, further south in North America, because uh, the frigid conditions in Edmonton required heating and hoarding uh, of all the concrete during winter, and uh, and a, a silica fume uh, concrete mix was used, which had uh, more stringent curing times imposed by the client. Uh, so, so whereas for a, a, a regular uh, cast in situ balanced cantilever, you might get down to, to seven days or 10 days for a pair of segments uh, as the optimum cycle times, seven if it's simple and 10 if it's a bit complex. For exodose bridges, I was chatting with Marcos before this and we think it's probably more like 10 to 12 days for the cycle time. Uh, this is the final picture of the bridge here. So this is showing the, the bridge as it was a few weeks ago. They're just running the first train across, installing the timber decking on the pedestrian bridge. And we're hoping to have it open in November to the public. So just to recap a few points and give you a few takeaways. Uh, Exodus bridges are, are an intermediary between girder and cable stay bridges. And they're useful in the span range ranges between 300 and 800 feet. Uh, they're generally more expensive than girder bridges, but they can be competitive for some projects where, where cable stay bridges aren't. The cables have a smaller live load stress range, which allows you to use a higher fee factor and get a bit more capacity out of the cables. The definition of the cross section is important, particularly the position of the cables. And there's that big watch it from from the RFK bridge and lesser extent the Tuatna bridge that the, the guide pipes from the cables, from the flat cables really do cut off a fair bit of your reinforcement and post tensioning in the deck. So Exodose bridges uses, use shorter, smaller and simpler pylons than cable stay bridges and using saddles is a, is a great way uh, to, to get those dimensions down. Finally, uh, the extra bridges are typically longer span bridges and, and the longer the span gets, then you need to start paying more attention to wind and geometry control. So with that, we'll, uh, we'll take any questions and I'll just note that I'll be at uh, ASB 2021 in Tucson. So come and uh, talk to me in person if you've got any further questions as well. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Luke uh, and Marcos. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pop over and I don't know if we'll need to go back to the presentation, but um, if you all want to turn on your uh, your your webcams, that's great. Um, I want to also introduce uh, Tim Berry as our moderator for the Q&A. Uh, he's the ASB Construction Practices Workgroup Chair 
uh, vice president and area manager for RSNH and their construction management practice. He has over 20 years of experience in uh, in bridge construction, done a lot of segmental bridges uh, in the U.S. And so I've asked Tim to come in and serve as our moderator today. And uh, unfortunately, Tim's in a place where his webcam's not working. So you won't get to see Tim on screen, but you will get to see Luke and Marcos. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tim if you want to go ahead and, and uh, field a few questions. We can run. I mean, we originally planned for the webinar to run an hour. If we run a little bit long, uh, that's fine, I think, for our presenters and for me as well. As attendees, if you all need to need to step out now since we're past the top of the hour, I totally understand that won't impact sort of the minimum attendance time requirements uh, for professional development hours. But, uh, but certainly if you can, hang with us. I'd appreciate it if you can. So with that, Tim, floor is yours. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, Marcos and Luke. Um, that was that was actually really fascinating. Uh, we do have some questions that came in from the audience, uh, so we'll just start off the top. Um, wondering what uh, what design software was used for uh, the question was for RFK, but for the other bridge as well. What what design software did you, did you use? In RFK, we used Sophistic. And okay. Tuatna was was Midas. Okay, thank you. Um, I had another question about uh, were there any special details for temperature movements? Uh, probably more more prevalent in the in the second bridge that we talked about than the first. But for either of you, uh, were there any special details or, or considerations made? Well, the when you're doing a longer span bridge, the movements need to be looked at looked at very carefully and. The detailing of the bearings and expansion joints definitely gets more complex. So there was no no very special details, but just some some larger expansion joints and and bearings than you would see on a a smaller span bridge. Yeah, and in the case of RFK, Ireland has the I'd say one of the at least let's see how climate change goes. But so far, has a very benign claim, and there's not actually a massive difference between winter and summer. Or even during the day, it's very difficult to achieve like a large gradient. Obviously, temperature were measured as part of geometry control, and, and there was a neutral temperature and corrections applied. But it was not as significant. Ireland has a very, very short range of temperature in general. Yeah, well, you don't even need to use curing blankets or, or ponding water in an island, do you, Marcos? It just rains enough yeah. so that it just cures. <laughs> exactly. All the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Round the clock wet cure. That's perfect. <laughs> That's right. Um, what kind of horizontal clearances were needed for construction for, uh, well, again, I guess go for both bridges? Sir, what, what do you mean by horizontal clearance? Yeah. In... For, the, for the structure, for either during construction or for the, for the final product, were there any special considerations or what, what were the actual horizontal clearances you had to maintain? In River Bar, there were not particular requirements. In it was a navigational channel, obviously, but the Fort Traveler uh, itself, we had a, a, lim a, a reduced clearance required in the main span uh, during construction. Uh, the, the final clearance in, real in, in River Bar is are for uh, vessels that don't exist yet, or at least, but they do exist, but then they don't actually. Uh, they're not operational in, in River Bar. There is a port upstream in, in New Ross Town. So it was not an issue in that regard, as in it is for a future proof uh, scenario rather than the current ones. So in reality, we didn't have any uh, uh, additional clearance during construction. Yeah. In, in, the, in Edmonton, in, that, that river doesn't have that much marine traffic on it, but there, there is a, I can't remember if it's like a party boat or a, just an old sort of paddle wheel, wheel of boat and, and uh, the clearances were set to let that boat uh, safely navigate through. Okay. Um, this is a good question. Uh, what types of corrosion protection measures were used for the cables and the and the strands? They're not different than you will have in a in a conventional cable state bridge. The whole technology of the saddle, the cable, it says with a, a collective HDPE and, and internal uh, strands with all with their own uh, HDPE and galvanized strands, which is a three-layer protection system. 
is the very same one you have in a in a cable state bridge. So the whole technology, the anchor, the cable itself, and the duct and the saddle are not different from a conventional cable state bridge. It's just what I mentioned that you might achieve higher stresses, a higher tension force in your cable depending on the stress range and the traffic and so on. What makes the Stratus bridges peculiar and more effective in terms of the use of cable? But the whole cable technology is exactly the same that you might have in a conventional cable stem bridge. That's my experience in, in, in RFK and in other bridges I've done before, Stratus bridges. Yeah, and just to add to Marco's reply that the strands can be replaced one by one yeah, as well. Exactly. In the future. We we yeah. on the on the one in Tuatna we we uh, I think we put I think we put 43 strands or you know we put 41 strands in the 43 strand anchorages and two of those are able to be taken out in the future for inspection purposes. Yeah. And then the the other two holes are in case you know, some strengthening or something down the line requires some more strands be added. Yeah, similarly, the uh, RFK, uh, the, the cables are replaceable strand by strand. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so question about uh, the wind uplift discovered, I think, Luke, this is, I think, what you focused on during your presentation. Um, the question is, how are the issues discovered was it just following the code or were some other wind studies done or how, how are these issues found and addressed yeah so we 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 knew that the spans were sort of pushing pushing outside of the regular envelope so we did do a wind tunnel test of the bridge uh, so we, we did wind tunnel testing uh, we didn't do the full aero elastic, elastic model whereas which is when you build a little model and you put it in the wind tunnel we just did what's called sectional modeling, where you just take the, the cross section of the bridge, and um, and through that, and then the subsequent wind buffeting models that we built, that that's how we discovered that uh, it was a lot higher than than Ashto. Um, one interesting point as well is is uh, although it didn't really turn out to be an issue because the bridge is double decker, we also thought that might have had some some weird wind behavior with the with the pedestrian bridge on there. But um, it didn't didn't adversely affect anything. Uh, there was a second question with that. You mentioned the, the pedestrian bridge. Um, was there any lateral displacement of the suspended pedestrian bridge due to the wind? Um, it, it, it will displace the the hangers are actually vertical on the bridge, so the the pedestrian bridge gets all its stiffness through through the. The girders uh, through the through the floor plate basically, but because it's it's quite a wide bridge with pedestrian lanes on both sides and a cycle path, there's enough enough stiffness in plan to to keep those deflections pretty low. Okay. Um, what was the total construction time for each of the two bridges? Uh, River Barrow Bridge. Uh, the DNC contract was signed in January 2016. The construction started like four or five months after. I think it was in, in May 2016. And it was open to uh, traffic in January 2020. So it's like maybe less than four years. Okay. And on Twat, no, I think we started at the beginning of 2017 and it's finishing up as we speak. Yeah. Okay. Um, and another question about uh, due to the, the slenderness of the segments, um, were there any issues with consolidation of the concrete during during production? Uh, I'll say the issues that uh, we had many issues in in RFK, okay, but they were not related with the slenderness much. But actually, high strength concrete mixes are difficult to do. And difficult to place, particularly in large volumes uh, when they're not actually in seg brick segment. And doing that in over a river, and particularly well, Irish winters, I'm saying, are not very harsh, but if you're actually concreting at seven, eight degrees, you're very close to the minimum temperature. And in, a, in an 11 KSI concrete, uh, the mix is critical. So it was more about actually the workability of the mix. And as I was saying, we discovered that the young models was probably softer. And extrapolation from the tests uh, were telling us, particularly at 
at 36, uh, 40 hours. So th there were more issues in relation to workability rather than the slenderness, particularly with the high strength concrete. I mean, everything that goes over like a 10K size, which in Europe is around 70, uh, 80 megapascal concrete, uh, you need to watch out and have a very, very good plan in how are you going to place your concrete, how workable it is. Because at the end of the day, the other issue in, in segmental uh, extratos bridges is that you have obviously the main cable uh, shallow and uh, a lot of rebar and congested areas. If you put it all combined with a concrete mix, it is uh, it becomes the uh, more challenging uh, part of the work uh, in my experience. But it's not that much related to slenderness of like webs being thin or like sections uh, not being deep enough. It's, it's more about actually high strength concrete and workability in my experience. Gotcha. Okay. Um, just a general question for, for each of you, this is just an opinion. Why do you think we don't see extra dose in the United States as much as we do in other places around the world? What, what would you think would be the reason for that? Aesthetics. In my experience talking to some of uh, the guys, that design, particularly Japanese engineers, that in Japan for whatever reason they love them. They like short towers, they kind of minimal lines. So it, there is a, a very, in my experience as well, by talking to the owners of like a, a personal aesthetic choice and people liking these short towers. And, and if you look at it, St. Croix, for example, I like that bridge. I think it's a very good design. And if you go for a chunky balance cantilever or a statement tower, probably won't have the same kind of rhythm. So it is a particular type of structure where aesthetics, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, so it, there are trends that some cultures or countries like more than others. And my experience is by looking at statistics, the Japanese have far more stratus bridges than any other country, is that it might find them appealing. And the, the Indians at the moment are doing lots of them in India. There are many, many multi-spanic stratus bridges being built uh, in India. So to me, there is a fashionable component or trend that might, that might become, I think there is, it's, an, it's a very nice solution when you don't want to go to a chunky, deep beam or like a very large long span that I, I, I'm obviously there is a clear case which is short towers when you have height constraints and you need to cover certain clearances and you're close to an airport for example but there are many others that is purely aesthetics and purely choice and that depends on what people find appealing visually yeah and just to add to I think another thing another point Tim is just awareness of the solution right I think, yeah. I think you know 20 years ago there wasn't that many in the in the u.s but uh but there's there's probably i can think of i don't know 10 10 these days um hopefully this presentation will inspire a few more <laughs> i agree um I mean, I can't... All right, well, thank you very much both i, I honestly I, I i find this topic very fascinating and i think I think we had maybe record attendance for this webinar, so I think others out there do too as well. Um, but thank you both for your time. I will just add, we, we didn't get to everybody's questions. We are definitely running a little bit long here, but uh, we will make every attempt to to try to answer the questions that were listed in the in the question box and try to get answers posted to those. So uh, thank you very much, and Greg, back to you. All right, well, thank you. Yes, gentlemen, uh, great. A really interesting presentation, and I'll, <clears throat> I'll echo what you said, Luke. Hopefully this uh, presentation helps uh, expand that body of knowledge here in the U.S. and, and uh, inspire some folks to use the structure type because um, I think there are certainly plenty of locations where where it has applicability. And as Marcos pointed out, aesthetics being one of the one of the real primary ones, they are really attractive structures. I um, I'm, I so can't get seem to get Asby convinced to let me go to Ireland to see the Rose Kennedy Bridge. I may have to do that on my own nickel. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, again, thank you, gentlemen. Great presentation. Appreciate your time today uh, putting this together for us. Uh, and again, to the audience, uh, thank you for those members, those folks who, who hung on here through uh, running a little long. Um, and again, a recording of this will go up with uh, permission of the authors. We'll put a PDF of the presentation as well. Um, opportunity and if you have colleagues who missed it then they'll certainly be able to see the the recording um, at, a, at a later time kind of at their own at their own time so again um, we'll be sending out certificates of attendance to those who, who attended today uh, give us about a week to get those out to you but otherwise uh, we'll go ahead and close the webinar so again thank you everybody 
Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.